Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be here and to spend some time with you today at the sunset of the Open Source Summit. Um, I certainly hope that everyone has enjoyed their uh, involvement so far and that you've been able to uh, find yourself uh, gaining much more useful information um, than what you started off with when it comes to this event uh, in particular. Uh, I'd like to thank the Open Source Summit. Um, this is the Linux Foundation for having me here. Uh, it's certainly an honor and a privilege. Today, we're gonna be focusing on our workshop and we're gonna take a little bit of a journey today together. And we're gonna be focusing on driving innovation through allyship. Now, I know a lot of you have heard that were before and probably some of you are versed in it and studied it but we're going to take a journey today and we have some minutes uh, to do so and so the first thing i want us to do is to look at the state of driving innovation and so let's go over to our next slide position and so driving innovation through allyship the first thing i want to say and communicate is express to you is that this is a guilt-free environment today. Um, we're not out to guilt anyone. We do want you to feel comfortable, uh, but we do want vulnerability. We do want open minds to what's gonna be expressed and shared. And I think as a consequence of you being here, I believe that you're ready to presume that type of disposition. So driving innovation through allyship is taking allyship and making it become actionable so that it's no longer something that we just talk about, but it's something that we exercise in our daily lives free from specific tailored detailed programs. You know, when we talk about the subject of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and many of your companies that you work at have these departments, but we know when the time is not to no longer talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is when we find ourselves exercising that daily. So the first thing I want to do before we go and begin our trail of a journey together, which I'm so happy to do with all of you here, is I want to go on and let's talk about what's an ally. So before we move forward, for those of you that have a sense of what you believe is an ally or that knows what an ally is, I want you to put that in the Q&A. I want you to send that. But I want you to take a minute, just a moment to think about, do I know what an ally is? And if I don't, why not? More importantly, why should I? And how can I know more? But for those of you that do, let's take a moment and put that in the Q&A. And so while you're thinking about that and while you're doing that, the format is that I'm gonna share some things with you all, and we're gonna go down this trail of a journey together, and then we're gonna have a bit of Q&A towards the end. And I'm so happy that the Linux Foundation has taken on these type of narratives and incorporated it into this type of open source environment. And we'll touch on that in a little bit as we move forward. But it's important, I think, for those that have had the benefit of listening to other speakers that have presented on the subjects of equality, I think you've benefited thus far. So moving on and moving forward, it gets to the question of why are we here? Now, some of you may say, okay, why am I here? Well, I came here today to learn about allyship, or I saw that this was something that I think could be beneficial to share with others at the office, if you will, the virtual office. Uh, I wanna become an ally because I've been hearing more and more about this in the news and media segmentations, and I feel like I wanna be a contributor, or I just want to know more about what it is to be an ally. But I want us to take that question further. Right? I want us to go deeper with that. Why are we here? 
Now, we laid out all those reasons of why many of us may be in attendance, but let's look at it at a much more broader 30,000 foot view. Why are we here? Well, there's a lot of things that are happening in technology in particular, which we're talking about through innovation. There's a lot of things that are happening in technology and happening across the country that we're seeing. There's a lot of impassioned hearts, a lot of impassioned minds. There's movements such as Black Lives Matter. There's organizations where people are looking at what's happening as two pandemics, not just COVID-19 that we find ourselves in, but also at the self same time, an anti-racist pandemic. There's voices for cries of equality that are happening, not just in the streets and in protests, but in job and work environments as well. And so there's been an amplified discussion narrative and a dialogue that's happening right now, right now in this country. It affects our workplaces, it affects our everyday living. It's even found its way in our conferences. So as we ask ourselves, why are we here? Not just why we're here at this particular moment in this particular session today, but why are we here? Why are we yet still having these type of conversations? Because evidently we haven't had enough action. But for now and for this moment, why are we here? Is because we want to do one thing in particular. Today we want to learn how to become better allies. And in particular, how do we make differences through technologies for black communities? So hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Lafayette. I'm an international national speaker on emergent technologies. I also speak on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking about this here in Silicon Valley, where I'm at, and around the country, uh, and also around the world on a number of subjects. And I firmly believe that when we talk about ecosystems that when I look at technology, I look at culture, I don't look at those two differently, but to look at culture as technology and to look at ecosystems, not necessarily as a bunch of hardware and software, open source environmental systems, and not necessarily a Raspberry Pi uh, and a motherboard in which to operate on, but to look at ecosystems as people. And it's a big part of what I call ecoculture which are human characteristics that are permeated in and throughout technological ecosystems. And to look at this ecoculture and to look at these environments, for us to know and understand that the more diverse or the more culture that we have in our ecosystems, the whole leveled up and stronger that our ecosystems become. And as I had the pleasure of expressing earlier this week, that we have to go back. Because there's a lot of things that we found ourselves leaving behind. And if we ask our own selves internally, how did we get here? And what were the hurdles and the obstacles? And what did it take and the opportunities that were afforded us and presented to us to actually get to where we're at this very day? Here at the summit together, what did it take? I think we all can admit that we certainly didn't get here on our own, that we've all been afforded opportunities, including myself, and that somebody somewhere down the road, at some point in time, pointed us in the right direction. And so as we find ourselves, and as we've heard this week about the incredible leaps and bounds of where we've come from when it comes to innovation and technology today. And us being at the doorsteps of Industry 4.0, being under the banner, under the umbrella of emergent technology growth. And as far as we've come, we haven't come far enough. And that when we look at technology, and when we look at technology where we're at today with everything that we've built, and as great as it is to know that there's room for improvement and that it could be greater and that our technology will never be at its best until everyone can build it. So when we talk about extending realities, if we're going to extend reality, 
then we must bring reality with it. And if we're going to build technology, then we need to hire the people that we want to buy our products. So today is about those in attendance. How do we become, how do we become better allies that aren't program oriented, but want to manifest allyship every single day in any given opportunity and how we live? Now, someone asks, how? Okay, Chris, we hear that. That was fine to hear, but how do we do that? Well, let me tell you what it's not going to be. We're not going to do it by developing an app. It's certainly not going to be done by coding and designing and to building out. There's nothing technical here in that regard of what so many of us are used to operating as technologists. The open source environment in which we need to penetrate and to deal with is internally, is within. For us to take a look and take inventory inside, and the type of hacking that we need to do is we need to hack ourselves. Because an app hasn't been built for where we're headed. There is no technological construct that we've made that can get us where we need to go. Yet, within our own selves, our human bodies, these engines, lies the answer and solutions for going further. So how is not externally, how will start internally. But the biggest step that we're looking to take and the most prudent activity that we're going to ingress into it's becoming actionable. Well, what does that mean, action? Well, we've been seeing over the last several weeks and even the past month, there's been an outcry of unity and support for those, particularly in the black community. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. I'll be the elephant. I came to Silicon Valley with black colored skin and I found myself in situations on multiple campuses where whole entire companies and whole entire cities, people that didn't look like me. But believe it or not, I was taught by a lot of people that look like you. And so becoming actionable as an ally means less talking, more doing. We cannot no longer just settle for just having a social media post as solidarity. Sure, I understand there's people that protest and want to go on the front lines, and, and I'm personally not a protester, but that's for what they want to do. And everyone has a role to play, and they must be allowed to play them. But we need action. And so as far as we've come in solving so many complex situations and things under, uh, under the auspices of technology, why can't we figure this one out? Why haven't we put some type of formulaic code together of humanity and made a hackathon of this? This is where we're headed, and this is what we're going to be doing. But before we do that, we have to become actionable and less talking. Sure, you can post on your social media posts. You can black out in solidarity for what's happening with black communities. That does so much. But do we want to be met with the self same situation six months from now? What about next year? 2020 has been a wild ride. 2021, do we want some more of this? I certainly don't. And I'm almost sure that you don't as well. Moving on. The first step is acknowledgement. One, acknowledging that there is a situation at hand. Acknowledging that many of us, or many of you, if you will, guilt-free, guilt-free, have been privileged, have had opportunities that other people have been afforded. Now, someone says, well, it's been hard in my life, too. I've had to go through a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges. No one's taking that away from you. I believe you. And many others believe you as well. But just know that when we look at the data that's afforded to us, 
And when we look around, and even in your own office, you must admit to consider that when you look around your own office, which is probably virtual now, but when you do it, how many people do you see that look like me versus how many people that look like you? Feel free. When we look on TV and we see the impassioned hearts and minds and the tearing down of stores, the burning of cars, the screams for injustice, what's that about? Where'd that come from? Well, part of that is a large part of society that we have ignored or have not looked at close enough that is now here right in front of us. And we find ourselves in a situation where we look at it and if we acknowledge it, we have a winnable opportunity to do something about it. The second step, being proactive and not reactive. Why has it taken the deaths and the innocent deaths of several people for us to have this type of dialogue today. We seem to be reactive on issues only when it begins to affect us emotionally, in our work environments, and what we come to hear about, and what we come to see in our daily lives, whether that's through media, personal friends that may be hurt, that may be suffering, But let's consider looking at this differently and saying, you know what, there's so much more that I can actually do if I'm more proactive in getting ahead of this and in front of this as an ally, as opposed to always doing something after the fact of some tragedy having happened. You see, when we talk about being an ally every day, that means doing something about it every single day and not something that you feel like you have to go out of your way for. But something that you naturally do. And as we learn, look, we're learning more things about gender equality, more things about communities of color. Even myself is subjected to the same need to update my understanding on how to better be a better human since citizen contributor. And so I'd rather be proactive then reacted to a situation after the fact. Let's keep that in mind. Moving forward. I want to applaud each and every one of you for your courage. The mere fact of all the different events that we've had all week in the Open Source Summit, that you've taken time at its sunset and the conclusion of this event, to spend time with me and with other peers that you know and may not know, to talk about this very sensitive subject took courage. It took a lot of courage for you to click a few buttons from the comfort of your homes or even offices, depending on where you're at, to sit and have this dialogue and the conversation. And so it's of this self-same courage and this type of leadership disposition is what we're looking to see seven days a week, 24-7, around the clock, so that you can be the hidden hero. Because not everybody has the same courage. Not everyone has the same care. Not everyone has the same concern. But for some, so, for some reason, those of you that are sitting here with me today, whom I had the pleasure of being with, you do. Whether you decided enough is enough, whether you've asked yourself, have you done enough? And while we're at it, I want you to put in there as to why you're here today. We don't want that to slip. We don't want that to, I want you to add, I want you to put that. I want you to write that down. And then I want you to hold on to it. Because where we're going takes courage. This isn't going to be easy. It's emotional. But here's the benefit. When we look at innovating technology through allyship, the first thing that we want to be mindful of 
is that we're not doing this as a feel good initiative. Yes, it feels good to do this. Yes, it should feel good to do this. Do things that feel good. But we're also looking at this for the longevity of the technological construct itself. And that when you look at being diverse, look at inclusion, equity, and belonging, we're looking at it from a new lens and an updated lens of this being also a revenue driver, a form of sustainability, not just for those that build it, but for the whole technological sphere as a whole. You see, humanity and technology go hand in hand. You can't have one part of the country enjoying all the things that technology provides and affords us. And at the same time, you have those that are looking and walking on the same avenues and streets, looking at you enjoy a thing that they had no contribution to and for. There's a lot of anti-sentiment that comes with that. There's a lot of hurt that comes to view that. And at some point, as we've been seeing as of late, People will speak their minds about it and speak their hearts, however that manifests. And so instead of being reactive, let us consider being proactive in tackling this narrative now. And that is a big part of what we're doing today as a technology community and saying, hey, we've come very far with our innovations when it comes to autonomous systems, when it comes to open source society. How open is the source been for everyone? That's just not community of colors as well. And genders. What have we done through technology to build for everyone? But the first steps, being proactive, not reactive, being courageous, and then we're going to dive a little further. So what are our guidelines look like? No, I'm not going to give you a whole Wikipedia and length of information. Yes, there's a lot of good information out there. And you as an ally should and feel yourself imbued with the responsibility to go out there outside of sessions that we have with these small batch of journeys that we have together. To want to go outside and go explore for yourself further to how to become a better ally and to refine your understanding and at the self same time from student position to teacher to become the singular hidden hero you may find yourself in your office in your building or in your company virtually being the only hidden hero out of hundreds for some of you thousands now how do we start off open-minded so being open to the idea is that there's a lot that we don't know versus what we think that we know and what we do know because of what we thought we knew and what we think we know was working then there probably wouldn't be a need or a reason for us to be here together so having a sense of open-mindedness being subjected to refinement purification on our understanding of what we come to know and understand thus far in our sojourn of life and in the workplace when it comes to being a better ally and human contributor the second is vulnerability that's from the executive on down and around to be vulnerable to be a hero, or really a hidden hero, means vulnerability to stand and say what you believe when it's not just to yourself or to your close, close family, and sometimes even with your loved ones, to say what you believe in your own convictions, but to even to your own peers and to stand for that, to stand for others that cannot stand for themselves or not afforded the platforms that you and I are. To do that comes vulnerability. Wide open for everyone to see. This is what I believe. This is how I feel emotionally. This is what I'm about. This is what I'm for representing. But before we're vulnerable, we have to have an open mind to be vulnerable. And when we're vulnerable, it's okay. You'll be subject to scrutiny. 
you'll have people that may look the other way on you. And you may have friends that you're used to sitting and enjoying time with that they may not agree with you and they may not be as friendly as they once were, but your convictions and your principles will supersede that. Because you're one of the hidden heroes that realizes that we need to go back because we left a lot of people behind, in particular, the black community. You see, the reason that I'm saying this, I have just as much of a care for technology as all of you. Someone once asked me on stage, they said, Chris, from a lot of people, when did you first get into diversity? And I sat there in front of all of these people and I didn't expect this to be asked. They gave us the questions beforehand. And I had to think, when did I get involved in diversity and talking about it? But the answer that came from within and that I said was that I was born in it. You see, so many of my other colleagues and friends that don't look like me they're not imbued with this type of responsibility to be one of the ones, one of the very few that have gotten through and to give testimony and to share with you what it's like to come to Silicon Valley and to technology as a whole with black colored skin. You see, I was a kid and I would come home and I see my dad, who at the time I didn't realize was a hacker, a good one. And he would tear down and take apart computers and build them up. And he'd be sitting at his desk with a little light on, and I'd come and see it. And I'd say, Dad, what's the web? And he'd proceed to tell me. And I'd say, Dad, what's the internet? And he would go on to tell me. Now, years later, all the way forward, when I came to Silicon Valley, I did not know that the impact of what someone that looked like me would have. And I realized that all my friends I went to school with, all the people in my neighborhoods that also looked like me, they didn't have someone sitting there, a parent in their household, to tell them anything about technology. Next is willingness. A willingness to do more than what you've done already. A willingness to put just, not just a hashtag, or to blacken out your Instagram or your Facebook or your social media platform, telling people what you stand for, but a willingness to do more. Next on the list is servant leadership. You know, it was always taught, give back freely that which was given to you. And we have to ask ourselves, how much servant leadership have I contributed to my community, to technology? How much have I given? Have I given enough? Or have I been taking and taking and taking? Have I given back to the ones that have done for me? Maybe you don't even know the people anymore that did things for you, that provided for you. My dad's no longer around, but I still feel incensed, imbued, excuse me, with the need and the desire for servant leadership to give back. And believe it or not, not just to those that look like me. But it's so important for those that look like me, because when we head into Industry 4.0 and when we head into emergent technology growth and scale, when we start looking at artificial intelligence, making our decisions natively that are coming from advanced data sets to derive from the human mind, which minds is this AI curating its data from? Because if it isn't from people that look like me, and if it's only people that look like a specific homogenous group, then what are we about to find ourselves in? We're already dealing with a high amount of implicit and explicit biases, but when it comes to it, how much more are we about to be confronted with? Again, this is a guilt-free environment, but these are things that must be said. We can't have all the good of technology and all the advances and all the products without talking about a little bit more on how we can be better. So a lot of that begins with servant leadership to serve our communities, to serve your brother, to serve your sister, to give back, not just to take. Identifying self-limiting beliefs. Well, some said, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to be such a person. 
You didn't know how to do what you do now. But you're doing it. Back to the vulnerability. I don't know if I can do that because I just don't know if people will hear. You'd be surprised who would be willing to hear your message on what it is that you have to share and say, even within your own workplace. And so I challenge you to even reach out to others that may not have heard what you're hearing today and to share that, to go against your self-limiting beliefs, to do more than what you even your own self believe that you can be and that what you can do. So I want you to add onto this next list because I know that we have a lot of professionals and experts and I want you to put and enter into the question and write it down, even if for your own self, what else are we adding to this list? So we have open-mindedness, vulnerability, a willingness, servant leadership, and identifying self-limiting beliefs within that keep us from moving forward towards better being allies, especially under the subject of innovation. So take some time and write that down and then we'll move forward and we'll address some of those. So where do we begin? Whoop, too far. So I had to take, I had to have a talk with my own self. See, this isn't just me pointing a finger. I was always taught you're pointing one finger at someone, you got three fingers pointed back at you. And I've had to say, you know, I'm not going to blame society. I don't want to do it. I don't want to put down others and tear down others and say, how come you did this to me? How come you did? I said, what is it that I can do and control what I can control? And so I had to turn my eyes inwards. And I said, where do I begin? If I want an exact change and express change, how does that happen? And I came to find out that there's so many different roads towards ha that happening. There's so many different paths. but I decided to build one. And I wanted to do it where I could take all of you, all of you that have taught me technology, all of you that when I came to Silicon Valley, there were hardships, I'm not gonna lie, but we're not gonna rehearse what those were, but there were. Me finding myself sleeping outside of Google, living out of hacker spaces, building out of hotel rooms and from the seat of my car. It's been a long track thus far. But there's also a side of people that took time to advance and to level me up. And I said, my goodness, what if I can get all those people back from home to listen to all these new people that I met in technology at different organizations? What if I can get them to meet all these people and bring these two worlds together? Has anyone done that before on such a level? And so I lost an initiative called BTMP, the Black Technology Mentorship Program. Because I'm often asked before what we see happening in the country, and I was asked before that a lot, and I've even been asked now, Chris, how do we become better allies? What can we do? What solution do we have on there? Which way do we go? What do you need? So I developed a program that takes the best of technology mentorships speakers, our educator class, and our advisors to pair that with the best of our mentees that are available and students that want to know about technology, that already know about technology, that can't land a job, that can't even get an interview, that is stuck on some type of equation, that wants to know so much more about open source systems and Linux, that want to know so much more about how to build augmented and virtual reality, that want to know so much more about artificial intelligence, but they don't know the way to go. You see, they didn't have someone sitting at their home that was building up and tearing down computers into giving them and pointing them the way. And right now, technology is moving so advanced and so fast that even at their schools, if you were to develop curriculum and it did get passed through whatever filters that they have to go through for approval of curriculum and technology, by the time it was taught to these students, it would be outdated. 
you must admit to yourself, and I'm sure many of you can attest to this, probably even more than I can, that technology has never moved at such a pace than it is now. And it's only going to get faster. Our communication apparatus. In the last three months, I don't know, but I've had more Zoom conferences and conversations without traveling than I've ever had before. I've seen more of the inside of living rooms. <laughs> I've seen more people's living rooms in the last four months than I've had in the last five years. But communication is happening and it's accelerating and it's going really, really quick. And so we built this program to say, let me take the technology class and pair those with black communities. And so with the recommended path forward, I put it out there publicly. I have a large audience on LinkedIn, very large audience, very reactive. And I said, I need to be vulnerable and put this program out there. I don't want to do this. I don't want my peers to look at me as the person that has to be the representation for black communities. I just want to talk about technology like the rest of them are able to do. But somebody had to do it. And as the moderator asked me some years ago, Chris, when did you first get in diversity? I said I was born into it. Well, then I had to do something about it. And so I put this out there and I said, I'm going to present this to the technology world. And I'm going to put this out into my peers and some are going to judge me harshly. Some aren't going to want to talk to me. But I did it. And it's been embraced. It's one of the reasons why I'm here, because Linux Foundation said, you know what, we can do better and we want to do more. Chris, we'd love to have you here. And so here I find myself in front of my peers sharing and being vulnerable right now, this very moment in front of so many. There's a lot of people and so many strangers whom I don't know, but I know that you are my peers and I'm sharing this with you. And I put forth this program for the Black Technology Mentorship Program. And saying, hey, God, I found a way, everyone, that all of you can become mentors, each and every one of you. You go to ChristopherLafayette.com and become a mentor. And if you don't feel like you could be a mentor, you can become an ally. Or if you even may feel like you have yet a little bit to learn, you become a mentee. And so it's a program for mentors and mentees to thrive. Because we can give education and provide all different types of online courses available, but if we don't fulfill what we call the last mile and actually getting people jobs and helping inspiring entrepreneurs to become innovators in the right path towards even beginning a startup, then we haven't done enough. Now, some of our mentors will only ask for them to speak for one hour out of an entire year. All I want is an hour of your year to sit in front of, because since we're no longer subject to location bias, subsequent COVID, COVID, and that the world has decided that virtual communication is the way that we want to move forward in the interim time being when it comes to dialogue of expression and meeting and networking for events and business. To take just one of you that's sitting here right now and to put you in front of 2,000. We haven't gone public with it, but we've now reached over 1,000 mentees. So what would it be like for you to sit where I'm at in front of your conferencing tool in front of two, 3,200, 4,000 mentees simply for you to tell them what you do for a living. No curriculum needed, no slides needed for you to tell them who you are, where you're from, and what do you do for a living. That may seem so minuscule in our eyes. That may seem so boring. Because it's like, oh, you're just a Python developer? Oh, you do code in C? But for other ears and other hearts and minds that have never, ever even heard that, don't even know what that means could be the significant pivotal pivotal moment for them towards their whole direction in their careers and in their development. 
And so a few minutes with you could quite literally change a few decades for them. So when we talk about servant leadership, willing to be able to tell people what you do to thousands of people, sometimes maybe even hundreds, if I could tell you that one of the biggest ways for you to become an ally is through education and under the sound of your own voice and to share your experiences and to help someone to mitigate what not to do and to go towards what to do, that sounds like servant leadership to me. And in turn, what we're doing and contributing and giving back to technology, the third observer, if you will, what we're giving back into technology is we're actually making our products, keeping and considering everyone in mind. No matter the color, no matter the gender. And that everyone gets an opportunity to build, to innovate, to talk about it, to educate, and then they give back just like you gave to them, just like someone gave to you. So when we look at where, where allies are welcomed, it's programs like this, like BTMP. It's working with people that you never thought that you would find yourself working with. It's in places like this and in technology where we're welcomed. I want you to learn how to go beyond what you've done your whole entire life in your career and to do things different. But you're not alone. We have a host of allies that have already showed up. People I never even thought would even take the time of day to look at it, have looked in their own hearts and minds and say, you know what, I can do better. Companies and platforms, I don't want you to come by yourself. I want you to bring every single person that you know of that has the heart and mind and the disposition for open-mindedness, for vulnerability, to come and join us and pair our mentors, we as mentors, with mentees, and to know that everyone will be, will be welcomed, guilt-free environments, and that we're all learning together organically, and that we've got a lot of road ahead of us and a lot of wood to chop. And more importantly, to that point, that everyone gets to build and everyone has a role to play and they must be allowed to play them and everyone gets to contribute. Everyone gets to be part of this great technological construct. And so I want you to write down, what is it that you want to contribute? If you had a thousand or even a hundred people in front of you to teach them one thing, what would that be? What could you give back? What women that the powerful play exist and you get to contribute a verse? What will your verse be? What will the one verse be that you would share with others? Because we can talk about being an ally and we can have vulnerability and we can have open mindedness and even want to express and manifest servant leadership. But we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we want to teach? And if you can let a group of people, a group of strangers know one thing. When it comes to technology, one thing that you believe would be the most beneficial thing that they could know, I want you to write that down. Put it in that question box or write it down, fold it up, keep it to yourself. And then when the time's right, to share that with others. And if no answer comes to mind, I want you to consider that. I want you to take some time to think about that. What does that look like? And so everyone that gets to build, gets to build, and you get to express what you think is best because our situation, our experiences are diverse. And we all come from different places, some similar to others. But we all have had different paths and different tracks, and so there's a different story to be able to share. And I've built a platform that allows for you and your company to share. Because your company isn't just a company, your company is people. And an ecosystem isn't just hardware and software, an ecosystem is people. 
and more to the point, an ecosystem is culture. I said that one day you'll find yourself in a situation where you may look around and you may be alone or you may be in a room full of bullet, hidden heroes. You see, back home, where I'm from, a city called Oakland, California, a lot of people that look like me, right across the bridge in the water from Silicon Valley, where a lot of people don't look like me. But in Oakland, we have what we call hidden geniuses. Some know it and some don't. But our hidden geniuses will only ever be as good and discoverable as the hidden heroes that took time. And it's like Sacagawea, Ponce de Leon, Lewis and Clark. There was a journey ahead of them. They took time. They didn't know what was coming around the corner, what was down the path, but they took time. They rolled the dice and they landed. That's a lot like business. That's a lot like this program. And the better allies that we become, the better our technology will be. And if we don't do this, if we close our computers down and we walk away and don't do anything, we will never have been as great as we ever could have been. I hope that someone took time to hear what was just expressed. I'm looking forward to reading and answering any questions that may be here. We have the Q&A portion that's going in now. But my doctrine in business is build together and to build strong. Be courageous. Don't make this just another session. Join me in the journey and I will join you. I will listen to you. I will grow from you. I will learn from you. I will build with you and your companies and we will do it together and really do something meaningful, something that we care about, something that changes hearts and minds. And I promise when you see what your work has done in the face and the expression of someone else, then you know we've done our job. And when we no longer have to have sessions like this, where we don't have to have diversity, inclusion, and equity departments and black ERGs, and when we don't have to have sessions at the Linux Foundation, and one day I can sit here and completely talk to you about technology and never whisper a word about black communities, equality, bias, vulnerability, when you no longer hear that at events like this, then you know we've done our job. And we did, just like we did with everything else we built in technology. It was in our minds first, but one day it was in our hands and we saw it. And a group of people decided to come together to do it. And even these difficult times, we did it. So thank you. I'm going to take a look at these Q&A and see if we have any questions. I have no idea if there's been anything that's been expressed so far. So if you have any questions, I would encourage you to share uh, those and bear with me as I look at a lot of questions that we have here. And we're going to start with one from Albert Smith. And let's look at this and take a look at this so that everyone can see uh, this question. Bear with me with Albert Smith is, I wanted to understand why the lack of African-Americans in technology. Why do managers of company tend to hire people who look like them? How to change something which is a natural behavior? Oh, that's a really good question, Albert. And thank you for your courage and your willingness to want to know more about that. And so let's tackle the first question because it's a twofer. It's a two and one question we have here. So I want to understand why the lack of African Americans in technology. Well, a big part of it is, is that there's not enough education in the particular neighborhoods where a lot of the black community is. 
right? Teachers are not paid what they should be paid. I mean, our teachers are some of the frontline heroes, and they're certainly not given uh, what uh, they're due uh, to even learn what we all know in technology. That's number one. Two is, believe it or not, you have graduates from Cal Berkeley, for example, that are you know black engineers that I've talked to their alum in all different types of organizations that have expressed to me and told me that, Chris, it's not that they're getting interviews, but we can't even get them a interview. Now, consider this for a second. And now in Silicon Valley, I'll use this as an example, for every job opening, for every application, you have about a thousand jobs available. A thousand, excuse me, a thousand applicants per job, of which 750 that's white homogenous male applicants. True. 750. You have 250 that is Latinx, Asian, uh, female, if you will, and then you have black. Now, I've got a 1% chance of actually getting a phone interview and maybe a one third of a chance to actually get an in interview. So when you look at that, the odds are already so severely stacked against me, especially with recruiters are now taking the steps and, and hiring managers are now taking the steps to say, hey, you know what? We're going to have artificial intelligence sort out our applications. Well, the big question we have to ask ourselves is this AI that you've built natively, where has its data information or its data sets derived from? Because if I'm already trying to get through the gates of dealing with someone that is implicit or explicitly bias odds don't look too good for me now you got a ai conduit that's going to be doing the same and more of may not look so better so let's go to your second half of the question is is why do managers of companies tend to hire people who look like them how do we change something which is a natural behavior so that's a really good question the first thing i have to say is if you look around your company and you're looking around and around and everybody looks like you and comes from where you come from, you have a problem. That means you don't have culture. Look, African Americans have been driving culture for decades. Last time I checked, when it comes to our female population, is 92% of the drivers of, of retail in this country is female. Last time I checked, that 64% of the buying power in California alone was Latinx compelling that's very interesting so when we look at the situation at hand what my perspective is is i'm no longer trying to make the attempt to go and change the personification of the hiring manager i think it's far more prudent to change the hearts and minds for our mentees to identify bias how to mitigate bias and to hack their minds so that no matter who's at the threshold at the gates waiting for them, whom they have to go through to ingress to get a job, that they'll be imbued with a sufficient amount of information and intelligence to be able to handle and conquer any job opportunity when it comes to the hiring process. Now, to more to your point, and I'll say this and move forward, it starts with you, Albert, to communicate to your hiring managers because I'm not even in your company to even have that dialogue or conversation. I have been fortunate and have been invited to many technical campuses and helping them get along the way. And some are doing well and some aren't doing so well, but they're trying. I'll give them that E for effort. But it takes people that are on the inside that already have these jobs. Now, here's the I, I get it. When you ask someone to stand up for equality that's already working for a company, job security is usually the thing that comes to mind. If I do this, I may get fired or I may lose my job. Have the courage. Have the courage to stand up. That's what we're talking about with allyship is being vulnerable and knowing that, hey, you may not be the best person people want to be around if you start stirring things up. But if it's not you, then who? I hate to get such a remedial example or such a far back example, but in the days of slavery, there were people that stood up that didn't look like me. Let's bring up something more up to date. Civil rights movement, that wasn't all just black people. A lot of that were allies that helped make a lot of things happen. For me to vote, for my mom and dad to no longer have to drink as separate 
water fountains during Jim Crow. Those are stories that I didn't read in a book. Those are stories stories that I also, so the self sim one that told me about technology also told me, yeah, I had to drink another water fountains. My dad, my mom, they had to go to movie theaters upstairs. Can you believe it? Imagine going to your favorite restaurant and having to go to the back of the restaurant for your meal. So curbside pickup isn't new for us. We, we were doing curbside pickup in the 60s. So it takes the people that are already inside to help make the difference as well. It's not a single variable equation. It's multivariant. Jody, because I want to learn how to be a better ally and to help others become better allies too. Jody, that, that is absolutely admirable. That's a great reason to be here. That's a fantastic reason to be here. Moving on. Monica says, because I want to do allyship in a more meaningful way, as you should, as we all should. And so that implies that Monica is already doing allyship. But Monica says, hey, you know what? I'm going to do things in a more meaningful way, probably more abundant, I want to be more proactive. Fantastic. We need that. That's the type of disposition that we're looking for when it comes to allyship, folks that people want to do more because what we've done thus far, yes, it probably has benefited and served a lot of hearts and minds, but have we done enough? Have we gone further? I've had to ask my own self that, and I've been an advocate for years, and I realized even me, I haven't done enough. Jody also says, and let me publish this one for everyone to see. Yeah, here we go. An ally is someone who holds a position of some kind of privilege who actively uses their credibility to support someone who doesn't have the same access. This is about creating a more inclusive environment where every person can thrive. I hope that everyone agrees with that. That was well put. I absolutely agree with that. And so we're talking about privilege because when we talk about allyship, we've been hearing this word privilege a lot. It says, what do you mean privilege? I was born just, I came from, you know, all types of humble beginnings myself. But what we, want to stress and ease in a guilt-free environment is that no one's saying that you oppress people. No one's saying that, I'm going to say it, maybe a tough pill. You didn't have slaves, but you've benefited from slavery. You didn't tell people to go drink at the water fountains. But the ones that told you identify you and look at you different as the ones that they did tell to go and drink at those water fountains. Now there's this discussion of honesty. Some say keeping it real. Do you believe that you've benefited or not simply by the color of your skin? That's a question for you to ask and you're alone to ask. I'm not going to assume that on you. But you have to ask yourself. Now, if I had to make the assumption, I would say yes. Somehow, some way in capacity, you have. That system and that old way of thinking will only work for the success of technology for so long. If you look at so many different companies out there, ones and platforms we engage in every day, there are really ramped up dialogues that are happening when it comes to the narrative of equality. And are these companies themselves doing enough? I'm not going to say some publicly. I could, but I'm going to be good for now. Next, let's go to Monica. Someone with comparative privilege who uses it on behalf of those with less. Well, if we look at that, yeah. I think that's a big one, and I want to talk about that. And I want to highlight this one. And I'm going to publish that. Someone with comparative privilege who uses it on behalf of those with less. Look, everyone. We need champions. If there's anything that you get from today's session, if there's anything that you take away from this, from this discussion, it's to know that we need champions. That's you. 
you're sitting here and you're sitting with me. The program has been presented to you. ChristopherLafayette.com has been presented to you. A host of things that have been said to you, Ian, even this week. But those that do have privilege, those that do have opportunities, I'm asking for your help. Because with this program that I built, with what I put out there, I can't do it alone. And without you, this program doesn't happen. We need more champions. We need more people to go out of their way. And let me tell you, when we talk about this, this isn't affirmative action. Get that out of your minds that we're out to take your jobs. Yeah, I hear a lot of people in the discussion saying, well, if we do that, then what about me? No way I'm going to let you take my job away from me and my opportunities. When you bring more different people in inclusive environments, you level up the whole playing field and it creates more jobs. It doesn't take away from jobs. It creates more opportunities. It doesn't take away from your opportunities. It makes you better, makes your product stronger, makes you look better. It makes the whole narrative better. How many times do we want to, how many more protests do we have to see? How many more deaths do we have to see? It's fearsome. It's, it's a hard, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow, but it's happening and it's so anyhow. Now is the time to make the change. So when we look at this whole event, this time together, this journey down the road. And when you go back into the office on Monday, after hopefully having a wonderful holiday weekend, but when you go back, ask yourself, what have I done? And if the answer is not enough, which leads into what more could I do? Think about this discussion. Think about our journey today. And to know that while you're going back to work in your nice job, hopefully it's nice. I really hope it is. Because a lot of people are going through a lot of things right now. But when you're going back to your lifestyle, know that there are people, there are people that would fall on their knees to have one day of what you have the entire year. There are people that are desperately wanting to get in and to build, not just for compensation, not just to earn a living. Yes, that matters absolutely because they have as much desire as you do when it comes to building out technology and innovation. Don't you want to build better? Don't you want more contribution? Don't you want your products to be more identifiable to all races when they go to market? I'm asking you to work with me. I'm asking you to help me. I don't know if I've ever gone in front of an audience and asked that. But today, today I'm doing just that. So if we don't have any more questions, and I believe that we've gone through all of them, the ending of this, I'll say this. When my dad left, and upon his demise, my physical dad, when he left, I didn't have to wonder which way to go in life. He had been there for me my entire life, my entire career thus far. The day that he left, I realized that he gave me everything that I'm supposed to have. And I realized to this day, even spiritually, that I benefit to steer him, still hear his voice. And that the things that have been expressed to me, even in times past, I benefit to this day. And that when I came to Silicon Valley, and there were people like you that took time to listen and to really do a hand-holding with me, it changed my career, it changed my life. And so I want you guys to know and understand that since that's the case, 
we want and I want you to know that pay it forward to give back and I see we have more questions that are just added in because we're having a real conversation here and an open honest dialogue I want to read some of these questions because I don't want to let those go before we leave. But I can feel that you guys are talking and we're having a real honest to goodness conversation. Ewa Williams says, it creates a place for everybody. Patrick Chapman. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Ewa. Patrick says, I want to create a world where allies are not needed. That's where we're headed for. That's where we're aiming to. That's the direction that we're going in. That's where we want to be. And Patrick, I want to help build that world with you. James Perkins. An ally is someone that in community members identifies as actively supportive of that community. That's right. You see, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different communities. But I'd like to take the way the key word is actively supportive. That means it's not just something that I do as a feel good initiative on Monday and I completely forget about it on Wednesday. And I may think about it again on Friday and the next week to come after that, I no longer think about it ever again. Because when you stop thinking and when we stop thinking about the need for allyship, that means we stop thinking about the people that need our help. Can you imagine what it would be if someone stopped thinking about you? So let's go publish this one. We have a question here. And this question is from, and please forgive me if I spell, say it now wrong, Ika Chukwa Agbuchi. Welcome. Hi, I am totally ready to build this ecosystem of people with you. How do I go about this? I'm just starting out in the field of IT, and I'm particularly interested in making artificial intelligence more inclusive. What do I do at this entry-level position to build this inclusive economy? That's a really good question, and there's some complexities to it. So let's tackle the first one as we go. And we have some more other questions and statements. Hi, I'm totally ready to build this ecosystem of people with you. How do I go about this? Well, the first step is having the courage and the vulnerability to do what you're doing now is by attending this conference. So congratulations, you've arrived. You've taken the first step. The first step is to know more and that you've acknowledged the situation. And that goes for all of you sitting here. When we talked about acknowledgement earlier, you did it. So congratulations. You acknowledge that there's something to be acknowledged and that there's a situation at hand and that more importantly, there's something we need to do about it. Now, you're just starting out in the field of IT and are interested in making artificial intelligence more inclusive. Now that you're just starting out, I would submit to encourage you to take a look at, put pen to paper and to start to identify areas where you see manifested bias, where you see opportunities where things could be better when you look at natively the beginning of that machine learned sentient, if you will, and then ask the tough questions if you feel like you're comfortable enough to do it, but sometimes the vulnerability and the courage has something to do with not our comfort, but being uncomfortable and asking them, where does this information come from? And what communities does it affect? Because we need people that are looking at these products and saying, how does Siri or Cortana or Bixby or Alexa affect other people and people of color? Where do they get their information from natively? And other smart assistants and other chatbots and asking the tough questions internally, then reaching out to communities such as BTMP or others that you may know of, there's others and saying, this is some information I have, what do you think about this? And then start to ideate and create a dialogue and provide the solution on how to approach the situation when it comes to artificial intelligence more better when it's more inclusive. 
because artificial intelligence, just like virtual reality, augmented reality and the extended reality as a whole is extending reality. As I said earlier, that if we're going to extend reality, then we must bring reality with it. Well, a big part of that is knowing where the reality or the source of the information, the UI, UX, the design constructs come from, because design has a lot to do with this. See, this is such a good conversation because when you have art and you have design and technology, do know that you can have art without technology, but you cannot have technology without art. And so the influence of art itself in the culture that in which it's permeated in leads to the construct of the technology itself as a whole. And so we had to go back to first principles and to look at the beginning to know how to start off right to continue forward. I was always taught, you start off right, you end up right. You start off wrong, you end up wrong. So good question, and we appreciate you asking that. Another, Iwa, I would like everybody to pay it forward, both attitude, knowledge, and allyship. But everybody should really have this better attitude from childhood. Well, a lot of us grow up in different homes and in different situations. A lot of us find ourselves in situations where the ones that have raised us, they don't know this information. You know, general, this is a generational to generational situation and it's geographically taught differently in different locations. That's why when we talk about what are we going to do this and how do we approach this, the first thing we have to do is approach within our own hearts and minds. Control what we can control. I can't control my neighbor. I can't control my colleagues, nor do I want to. But I want to look within my own heart and mind and say, what is my singular contribution to society, to my technology community? What can I do to make the difference? Because one person can impact billions. It was says stewardship and strength. See everybody and adapt the one's own attitude. Help others to adjust their attitude. The way and the best way that we believe that you're going to adjust anyone's attitude is to be a product of the product. Be the change. So when I launched the Black Technology Mentorship Program, the hashtag that I decided to go with, and my team was asking, well, what are you going to go with? And I said the hashtag, which naturally should be, is be the change. I don't want to talk about what other people can do and what other people should do unless I'm doing that myself. And if I'm not doing it myself and suggesting others to do it, there's a disconnect there. I can't talk about equality. I can't tell you about anti-racism. I can't tell you about doing all those things if I'm a racist myself. I can't tell you about refining and having an open-minded approach and vulnerability if I'm not open and approach to, open to hearing what um, other people from other different communities of gender or other communities of color have to express to me so that I can learn more about them. Guidus Cardenas. Wonderful Christopher can relate in different ways. Can we connect via email? I'd be more than happy to, and I'm very much looking forward to that. You would? Tech should encompass and fit everybody and all. I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. It should be a place for everybody, not just because it's a feel-good initiative. You know, Silicon Valley became incredibly wealthy overnight. Yes, there was capital, and there was a lot of capital on hand beyond the last 20 years, but over particularly the last 10 years, Silicon Valley in particular and technology as a whole became incredibly wealthy overnight. And so they realize early on, it's not like they haven't acknowledged, perhaps even the Linux Foundation, it's not like they haven't acknowledged, hey, we have a diversity problem, we have a culture problem, deficiency, we have a gender problem, deficiency. It's not like they haven't acknowledged that. But they did it under the banner of saying, okay, let's throw some money at it, put some feel-good initiatives out there, and let's see what we can do to give to these camps and these groups, and, and, and let's say, hey, we're doing our part. Failure. So now they acknowledge, okay, that was first wave diversity. Now we're looking at second wave diversity and saying second wave diversity is, okay, let's look at that as a revenue driver because we need to hire the people that we want to buy our products and people from different cultures serves as a better cog, cog into our construct of our machines that we're building. That's a good one, but not enough. 
Now we look at third wave diversity. Now it's for the survivability of technology. It's not about a feel good initiative. It's not about a revenue driver. It's now about sustainable responsibility. That if we continue to ignore entire communities, that it will profoundly at some point impact all of us financially and emotionally. Now is the time to be proactive and not reactive. We have solutions as we've come together before when it comes to building out technology. I'm confident that we can come with solutions to make it better. It's not an overnight situation, but it has to start natively somewhere. And by the answers and the questions and the replies of what I'm hearing today, I feel more confident now than I did before I began speaking with you all today. And lastly, I'll leave you with this. If you don't have room to be a mentor, if you don't have room to be a mentee, if you don't have a desire to be an ally, but you still want to do something and you may not want to volunteer, fund it. That's right. I've never gone on a, online and asked anyone to fund anything. I just haven't. A lot of people have told me, Chris, you should. I haven't wanted to ask for a dime. But they said, you should, Chris. It's for a different cause. Because I've been embarrassed to do it. But now I'm going to say it. Fund this initiative. Become a sponsor or a community partner, in particular to the Black Technology Mentorship Program. If you don't enjoy enough time, you may be going through different hardships or what adjustments as we all are. Help me fuel this so that I can carry this further. I can't do it alone. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be with you all. I'm so appreciative that the Linux Foundation has began opening up its understanding for the need for inclusivity no matter the color, no matter the gender, for us all to feel comfortable, but also to have the dialogue and conversation to make us feel uncomfortable so that we can become more comfortable. I appreciate the courage of everyone that had participated. I look forward to hearing from many, if not all of you, soon. You can follow me on LinkedIn. You can message me. You can reach out directly to ChristopherLafayette.com. I encourage you all to take a look and adventure. And if we want to continue this conversation offline, I wholeheartedly support that. I ask that you build together and to build strong. I hope the very best for you and what's coming, especially in this new narrative that we find ourselves in this COVID-19 arena. I hope that everyone is being safe and will be healthy. And more importantly, I hope in the near future that we'll never have to have this dialogue again. Because we rolled the dice, sought after a new country, and we landed. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Be well and take care.